Welcome back to the Invest in Yourself podcast. Today's guest is 9-11 survivor Eric Ronigan. Eric was inside of one of the Twin Tower buildings the day of the plane crash attack. Eric ran into quite a bit of trouble while trying to escape. He did end up making it out of the building before it went down. Eric went on to write a book about his experience on 9-11. The name of the book is called From the Inside Out. Please subscribe to my channel for more interviews like this. And without further ado, let's get into Eric's story. Good morning, Adrian. Hey, Eric. How you doing? I appreciate you coming on, man. Well, thank you for inviting me. This is this is a, a privilege for me. Thank you. Same here, man. I really enjoyed the book. It left a great review. And if you guys at the end of this interview and you really think you want to read more about Eric's story and the other people in his book, you know, I'll put a link in the description. You guys can check it out. But, you know, the way we're going to start it now is we're going to talk about the morning of, you know, 9-11 and, you know, what Eric went through and what his perspective was. So take the lead, Eric. I mean, you, well, you can... thank you. Thank you. I'll do that. And feel free to uh, ask questions as I go through it or make comments. Um, we, we can keep this somewhat uh, not, we can keep it casual, as it were. Okay. But 9-11, uh, that's now, we're approaching 22 years. Wow. And, uh, and even though 22 years is a long time, when uh, when I talk about 9/11, you know, memory is an interesting mechanism. It just everything comes right to almost last week. It brings the past yeah. into the present, and uh, some of the details, the recall is gets a little fuzzy after after 22 years, but. Uh, the, the day is the day is right there and all of the events that took place. <clears throat> and I was going in Tuesday, September 11th, 2001. That was on a that was a Tuesday. <clears throat> it was really a special day for me because um, I had worked there not quite five years as a consultant. And my best friend, who is the director of security for the World Trade Center, <clears throat> which was the included seven buildings of which the Twin Towers were the, the primary uh, buildings. He was getting a promotion to be the security czar for all the facilities of the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, which is more than just a bus terminal, the largest bus terminal in the world. But the Port Authority ran, runs and ran, still runs, uh, JFK International Airport, LaGuardia Airport, Newark International Airport, a couple of other airports, the uh, George Washington Bridge, the Lincoln Tunnel, the Holland Tunnel, the three bridges into Staten Island, and uh, a number of other facilities, a subway system. It, it's, it, it's a huge facility. Sounds like so it. So I was, I was really looking forward to 9 a.m. September 11th because Doug and I were going to be in the, the, the what's the, basically the president's office and he was going to uh, promote Doug and he was going to make me a Port Authority employee. Wow. With, and you get vacations and medical coverage and all of that sort of thing. So it was a, it was a nice day. You get benefits, all those benefits, you get a, a retirement package. So it was a special day for me. And it was a particularly crystal clear day. You can see the, the blue in the background of the sky, it, which was unusual for New York City to have, have that crystal clarity to the day. And uh, so many people after the fact remarked about the clarity of the day. So I took my normal route into the, into the city. I live, I live up in, uh, in north of the city in Westchester County. <clears throat> so I'd take the train in to Grand Central Terminal, then uh, get on the subway and go all the way down to the World Trade Center site and then walk the last couple of blocks. And uh, I got to my desk on the 71st floor of the North Tower, which is, is oh, you can't see, you can't see my pointer. <laughs> it's, it's, it's the tower, actually it's the tower behind the one that you see there. Oh, okay. Um, that's the South Tower there, and there's a terrific story behind that that photograph. But I got up, I got my cup of coffee, went up to the 71st floor. My office, I had a window right on the uh, 
the south side so I could overlook all of New York Harbor. And I always took a few moments to watch the tug the tugboats tugging around New York Harbor and the various ships coming and going. And it was always just a, a delight to see all the activity. So I'm sitting down at my desk preparing for the 9 a.m. meeting. And I look at my watch and my, my boss is not in yet. And he's usually in the elevators when he's not in uh, at quarter of, quarter of uh, nine. And as I'm sitting at my desk, of course, everything's sudden without warning. That tower was like a giant boxer took his gloved hand and did a roundhouse blow to the top of it. And that tower sprang south, twisting, springing back north, twisting in the other direction, south and north, and then it settled. And I was, I was not a foot away from the windows. And it was about a 900 foot drop to the plaza. And I thought I was going to be slingshot through the window and out down to the plaza. It was that dramatic. Yeah. People that were walking, people that were walking through through the uh, the office fell to the floor. Equipment that was on top of file cabinets shifted and fell to the floor. And instantly I kicked myself back from the window out out of my little office space. And uh, when there's when there's when there's an emergency, the body goes into survival mode. And and the, the noise from that air, aircraft coming into the top of that tower, it was just an incredible roar. And I got back in my chair. I leaned all the way down so that my upper body is parallel to the floor. And I covered my head. It was just an automatic survival. And I instantly said to myself, stand up and die like a man. I knew that tower was coming down. So dramatic was that tower twisting and, and bending to the south and the north and the south and the roar. And I stood up and I looked out the windows and at the same time, a fireball came whizzing, sizzling, whooshing down, red, orange, yellow, and exploded right outside the windows. And I thought, oh my God, I'm gonna, it's my time to go again. But the windows didn't break for some reason. Wow. But the sound, it was really, really dramatic. Um, and then that magnificent view of the harbor and then looking east out the windows, you could see JFK on a clear day, the, the airport, turned into a, uh, you, couldn't, you couldn't see 10 feet. The debris that was pushed out of the upper tower, cardboard, paper, equipment, it was just incredible. And all that happened in just the first two or three seconds. And immediately, everyone on the floor yelled, evacuate the building, evacuate the building. And everyone just took off at a dead run towards the core into one of the three stairwells going down into the tower, down into the, to the main floor. But I had just finished a 20 ounce cup of coffee and I knew it was going to be a long day. <laughs> <laughs> so I did not run to the nearest stairwell. I walked to the men's room and took care of business. And when I came back, the cubicle, uh, two cubicles from mine was a young lady, one of the consultants, she was standing looking out the east window and almost paralyzed. So I went up to her and I put my hand on her shoulders and I said, Whitney, Whitney, are you okay? And she said, I I'm just putting my laptop away. And it wasn't until a year later when we had an anniversary luncheon for 9-11, we were discussing that day. And uh, she is a she recommended that we make a circuit of the office to make sure everybody was out. And each floor is almost a square acre. And we did, we walked that entire floor and we were the last two that were on that floor. And then uh, we split up because I, I said, I'll meet you in the stairwell. 
going down, I went back to my office to pick up the backups to the projects, our two-year project that I've been working on, picked up my little briefcase and uh, went into the stairwell. And my first thought was to go up into higher into the towers because I knew it was a mess up there and people needed help. But the flow of people coming down, it was just impossible to go up. I tried, wow. but it, it it was just packed for everybody that was coming. And each tower held around 20, 25,000 people on a full day. So it's a lot of people. <laughs> yeah, especially <laughs> coming down, I'm sure. So, I mean, it sounded like, you know, everybody was in shock. And when it happened to you, I mean, you just, like you said, you stood up and you're like, yeah, I'm going to die like a man. And I mean, you know, what, what, I mean, were you even kind of processing like who could have done this or like what happened or did you think it was an accident at the time or? It's a, it's an interesting question because my very first thought in the fourth second was somehow a commercial airliner is slammed into the top of this building. That was my first thought. Yeah. I mean, you, you what else are you going to think? I mean, you don't just think like it's a, uh, like. It was too dramatic for anything else. Yeah. I mean, everyone it's... says, oh, the Piper Cub and the Piper Cub, you wouldn't have even felt or heard or known. It bounced right off. Yeah. I mean, and you said the building's just shaking back and forth. Oh, I, mean, the, I mean, the buildings went beyond the design specifications. Yeah. I, I mean, spoke of the. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. No, I, I and it's in, in the book. I, I, t- are some of the engineers that said they were amazed that that building didn't snap and just yeah. fall over because yeah. it, it, it go beyond the design specs i mean it was really built strong i mean because you yeah. know for a building like that you know to shake back and forth and move around like that i mean you don't that's well, not something you see i mean nothing ever does that but no. plane no. comes through it but that's a different so, story so I got in. The, so once I was in the stairwell, I turned around and just kept with the flow of the people going down. And after about three or four floors, I noticed that Whitney was in the same stairwell. So I called her name, and we we got together and I escorted her down. And and the trip down took a little, maybe an hour, the seventy first floor. Um, it was calm. Those thousands of people. There was almost no talking. It was calm. There was no panicking. Um, there were two or three pockets where there was the aviation smoke from the explosion. And my goodness, you couldn't inhale any of that. And I thought, we're going we're to die right here in the middle of the stairs. Because there was no breathing. You just could not breathe. But we managed to get through it. Um, people were taking their... Sh- shirts off and making strips for nose masks to try to breathe through. And uh, on every, on every platform, you'd see people, you'd see people's jackets were thrown in the corners because it was starting to get a little hot in those, in those stairs also. Yeah. But uh, we finally made it down about, about in the teen floors, I had just I had just that morning put on a brand spanking new pair of uh, wingtip leather shoes to break in. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it was perfect for breaking in. Yeah, going all those stairs. I had, hadn't planned on walking uh, one thousand four hundred ninety one stairs to get out of the building. <laughs> <laughs> He's that many. <laughs> oh that my many. gosh! That was just the seventy first floor. There are 110 floors in that building. Oh, my God. <laughs> but uh, no one above the 91st floor was able to get out. No. Um, and in the teen, teen floors, there was water was starting to come through the drywall. And the drywall, you could hear the cracking of the drywall. And water was coming down. It was cascading down the stairs. So I was in my blue pinstripe suit because I was going to see the executive director to be made an employee that morning. So I wanted to be on my best behavior. <laughs> um, so there was there was reddish, rusty water pouring down the stairs. So I stopped and I rolled my trouser, trousers all the way up above my knees because I didn't want to get 
any of that on it. <laughs> when we finally got down um, and security was at the exit doors and all of the security personnel had formed shoulder to shoulder a corridor out of the building so that we couldn't go anywhere but where they wanted you to go. Mm -hmm. But I was also had been in security. Oh. And uh, my first question to the security folks were, you know where Doug Karpiloff is? He's the director of security. He's running the entire evacuation operation. And no one had seen him. But I broke through the line in the lobby and went up to the, the north windows to look out. And what a mess. It was the, the, the gray dust that was coming down, you couldn't see very far. And the plaza from where I was looking north to the building number six, which was the, uh, well, I'll think of it in a minute. Um, the, the plaza was strewn with debris, not only paper and boxes, but not two feet from, from me in the window were people or remnants of people that had come out of it. You'd been shoved out by the explosion or jumped to escape the heat uh, to keep themselves from melting. It was so hot and there's no oxygen. There were people literally, I just looked down at my feet in a foot and a half, two feet away. There they were all pretzeled in their suits. And I'd look out, look out around the plaza, and you could you could see a number of, of of those people. And then I went over to the east windows to look out over the the plaza where the fountain was, and uh, they'd give concerts out there on that plaza. And as I'm looking out, also more bodies, and instantly coming down from above, horizontal facing me was a man in his suit. And for an instant, as we hit, as he got six feet, it was like time froze and our eyes made contact. And in the same instant, he kept on going and his body exploded. And the fluids from that came up onto the window and were dripping off. Wow. And I said, that, I said to myself, I've got to get down to the emergency command center, which was in the basement of the South Tower. And I was in the North Tower because I knew my friend needed all the help he could get. Um, we'd run through a hundred, hundreds of scenarios of how we'd be attacked again, but this was not one of them. <laughs> who, who would be crazy enough to, to uh, drive an airplane into the tower and commit suicide to make a point? Yeah, I mean, you wouldn't think yeah. that. I mean, yeah. I mean, I I know, like you said, like you guys prepared for, or you know, you, you you did your best to prepare for this. I mean, so there was an attempt on these towers before, and like, what was it, ninety three or or something like yeah. that, or February February of ninety three, and what uh, the twenty sixth, a week from today, a week from now. So what was that about? Was it the same group of people trying to attack it? Well, it was different people, but in mm -hmm. And uh, they tried it with a truck, a truck bomb in the, in the parking garage and were unsuccessful. But there was a lot of memory of people that had been there. So they, so they knew instantly when that tower did crazy things, they immediately went to the stairs and ran down many of them. Yeah, because I mean, you I mean, from what you I mean, you're telling me, you know, I mean, a lot of these people were you know, well prepared, you know, for this and knew what to do, like, hey, go to the stairs, you know, got to get out of here. Yeah. They weren't like, well, twice, oh, go ahead. Yeah, twice, twice, a, twice a year, our, our fire control folks, which is all part of the security department, required every tenant to go through an exercise to have their people go to their posts against uh, next to each of the stairwells and be prepared to evacuate so everybody was well practiced twice yeah. a year yeah so they were really on top of that then they were well absolutely they were on top of it yes and big upgrades since the 93 bombings yeah but uh, so i take the escalator down into in, down into the main entrance of the of the towers 
well, the escalators weren't working. So, of course, I, I walked with people. And uh, those huge signs that, that uh, point directions down there in the elevator areas were all dangling and, and broken. And I got down to the lobby. There were three, three bays of elevators going, going up. And many of their elevator doors were blown out and just hanging, all cock, cockeyed. And the lights were out. And so I was going to go through the mall. And through the mall, there must have been about 20 revolving doors to get from the lobby into the mall, big mall under that whole complex. Mm -hmm. And all those doors were all blown out. Jesus. And as we walked through those doors, it was like Niagara Falls. The water was pouring down. So we walked through the water. And here I am in my blue pinstripe suit, trousers rolled up, carrying my little a little fabric briefcase <laughs> and uh and i break through the, the security line and there's water maybe uh ankle ankle deep in the entire mall from the fountain and the the um, fire fire systems and i walk south a couple hundred feet to get to the south tower so i can get into the basements to go down and uh the the entry to the basement was behind ben and jerry's and as I got to Ben and Jerry's, there were policemen and firemen, and uh, they're all yelling at me to get out of there. And I refused. I told them I'm going down to give a hand in the emergency operations center. And here I am, in my pretty little blue pinstripe suit, <laughs> soaking wet, my trousers rolled up above my knees, which I'd totally forgotten about. And I'm totally exhausted. But I finally convinced them that, that to let me down but they said you're going to have to wait we're bringing equipment up from the stairwells so i said okay i wasn't standing there five seconds and i i don't, I don't know what it was my whole body started to dance i had to move i had to get out of there so i went into the lobby of the south tower same conditions as the north tower signage elevator doors no lighting and i walked I, I went to the three areas. I went to the visitor's desk section, nobody, the center section, and to the north, the east section, to the fire command desks, nobody. And while I'm in there, I hear a low-throated groaning, grinding from somewhere deep within the bowels of the tower. I'm so exhausted, it doesn't register. My whole body is aching after 1,491 stairs yeah. coming down. That's a lot. <laughs> and I was I was 58 years old at the time. So I was I was a young, a young, young stud. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh um, man. So I went, I found myself back into the in in the mall. I waded through the mall, went over all the way to the northeast side and climbed up and got out on Church Street and turned around and both towers were in flames. And I didn't know about the, the second tower being hit. And uh, so I said to myself, well, I can't get into the basement to help my friend, but there are people in the plaza that need help. So I'm literally marching south on Church Street, which is the perimeter of, of one of the perimeter streets of the World Trade Center. And there are thousands and thousands of people just standing, looking, gawking, because they evacuated all the buildings in, in southern Manhattan up to uh, Canal Street. That's a lot of people. That's, that's over a million people yeah. that they evacuated. But there's many of them are standing there gawking. And just as I'm about to turn west to go into the plaza to get between the towers to help the people that are look like they need help, a little voice in my head said, walk east. I was at the T intersection of Fulton Street. Uh, the Millennium Hotel was right there. Mm -hmm. I did a military left flank and I walked maybe a dozen paces and it felt like an earthquake. I thought the street was going to collapse under me and under whomever was there. We'd all fall into the subway system. And that would be that. And at the same time, I turned and twisted and turned to the right to watch the South Tower come down. 
Jeez. That tower is coming down. And I said to myself, my God, it's going to land on us and kill us all. Man. But where can you run to escape yeah. a quarter mile high building? Yeah, I mean, we're, and that's what, you know, I'm thinking too, you know, and it's just insane how much, you know, when when it comes down, I mean, it just shakes, you know, everything like an earthquake and everybody, yeah, I mean, and, and, you know, from your picture behind you, I mean, look at all that debris falling off and, you know, if that yes. hits people, it's going to stab them in the head or, you yes. know, anything go right through them. So yes. for you and anybody else that was around this, did how, where did people take cover? How did they survive this i mean like when it was coming down did it actually expand all over blocks when it came well, it, down it did the minute it began to come down those thousands of people on church street panicked mm. and i was right in the middle of them oh gosh and I, and I knew i instinctively knew from 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 something i'd read or whatever as, as, as a as a youngster you never, ever, ever want to be caught in a panicking crowd. No. So what I did, and now, now I'm walking east. The street did not collapse, so I can we can all still walk. They instantly ran. And just to backtrack just a, a couple of minutes, when I got onto Church Street, I noticed that there were blood splotches on the street about every 30 inches or so. And I, and I was thinking to myself, What's what's with what's with the blood splotches on the street? And then I forgot about it. But now the crowd is panicking. And I match my speed to their speed. And I work my way over to this to the right so that I could tuck myself behind the loading dock column of the Millennium Hotel and let everybody run by me. <laughs> so I did that. And also I noticed that. High women went in high heels and men in loafers. They were running out of their shoes. Mm -hmm. The shoes were literally flying through the air. And now I know where those blood splotches came from. People were stepping on the shrapnel and cutting their feet and running. Oh. And there was a lot of blood splotches on that street. Oh my God. <laughs> no. I mean, yeah, that makes sense. You know, to yeah. when you think about it like that and being right there i mean you you notice all these small little things that you know that, that nobody else to think of unless you're there you know like people taking their shoes off you know and then you know walking around and stepping in making blood blood footprints yeah. and stuff you know i mean so when, yeah. when you, you were able to take cover and then what happened after that did everything just you know the whole streets and everywhere just become full of dust and Stuff like that. Well, yes, I, I waited for the for the majority of the people to pass me by and the shrapnel to pass me by. Mm -hmm. So I stepped out to go west to go back to the towers so I could be of some assistance. And as I stepped out and turned west, that 800 foot high pyroclastic cloud of dust and debris was I, I just stopped and looked up. And it was coming towards me. Oh. And I said, and I said to myself, I don't think I can survive one more incident like this. I was, I was exhausted. I couldn't move, Adrian. It was just exhausting. But of course, you have to, you have to, you have to take action. <laughs> yeah, no, I would imagine. Well, I mean, you walk down all them stairs, you run away from the building that's falling down, and now you got to run away from this cloud. <laughs> so I, I, so I turned, I turned around. And that little voice again said, walk east. So I walked. I didn't run. I didn't want to run and get caught up in that panic because it can be contagious, but I can walk pretty fast. And uh, I kept an eye looking behind me on that cloud. And just as, as it was about to hit, I took a big, deep breath to hold it. And there was like a force five. You could feel a little punch as it, as it hit. Mm -hmm. And all of the screaming and all of the yelling that was going on from all these people running away in panic instantly stopped. My vision was pitch black. There was no more sound. And I kept walking and holding my breath. And of course, I wondered where everybody went. But of course, they couldn't breathe either. So they're not going to go screaming. No. Because you can't, <laughs> you can't inhale it. Um, 
So I kept walking and I kept walking and I kept walking and I, I took my jacket and I tried to cover my face to breathe, but it was, it was too late. It was too late. Everything was, it was, and I finally had to inhale, exhale and in, inhale. So I did that a couple of times and until everything was blocked. My throat was blocked. My nostrils were blocked. My eyes were frozen open with all the grit from the pulverized sheetrock and concrete and everything that that uh, was included in that that collapse. <clears throat> and I kept walking as far as I could go. And finally, I'm at, at the end. I said, well, this is it. I'm finally going to go meet my maker in some unknown street in lower Manhattan. And my knees are, are weakening and I'm beginning to collapse. And just over to my right a little bit, I see a little fuzziness that's different than the rest of the of the cloud. And it was it got my attention such that I it took every bit of will and strength I had left to straighten up and take one pace forward. And it was a man opening the back door of a delicatessen. I followed him in and it was clear and all the help were handing out liquids. So I took one, took a, took a swallow, and that opened the throat. So now I can inhale and breathe again. Mm -hmm. And uh, we stayed in there for, oh, I don't know how long we stayed in there, half an hour maybe. Jeez. And, and they were handing out drinks. And uh, I heard a woman yelling. And I turned and looked, and it was a woman on a, on the telephone, just screaming. So I said, oh my gosh, there's a phone in here. Long before the days of, of smartphones. <laughs> yeah. um, <laughs> Where you could take them with you everywhere. <laughs> exactly. So I went up to her and put my arm arm around her, put my right hand on her hand that held the, the, the receiver and calmed her down. And she, whatever, and I helped her hang up. And other people now are noticing the phone. And I had friends in, in, in upper Manhattan, midtown Manhattan, that I wanted to call. So I very carefully pulled their phone number out, put the quarter in or however much it cost, very carefully dialed their number, and Lee answered the phone. The wife answered the phone. I said, Lee, it's Eric. I made it out. And she said, do you know anything about Doug? Because we were friends. And I said, no. And I said, would you call my wife, please? And call my mother. Thank you. And I hung up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, at that point, you're exhausted. I mean, you just want oh, to make my... that one phone call and, you know, yeah. just get on and keep get moving, get out of there. You know, but you, you were yes. able to give them some so, confirmation. So the dust... Dust cleared sufficiently, so I left the deli, and I was going to go west, back to the towers to help. But the minute I turned, that little voice in my head said, walk east. Again. <laughs> it kept me out, that little voice kept me out of trouble. <laughs> so I did walk east, and I now I can, now I can see where I'm going. And uh, I, I end up on the Bowery, which the Bowery, has a reputation for having all the, the bums in New York on it, mm -hmm. which has changed now. There are people everywhere camping <laughs> on, the, on the sidewalks. But then yeah. Bowery was the it was the place to be if you were a, a bum. And I'm walking north on the Bowery with with tens of thousands of other people. And I'm an anomaly. I now look like the Pillsbury Doughboy. All that <laughs> dust has clung to my wet suit. Jeez. And so it's it's all it's all uh, dirty gray, my hair dirty gray. I had more I had more hair then. <laughs> <laughs> About a full head of hair back then. <laughs> and uh, everything was just totally totally gray, and people were coming up to me offering me their cell phones to try to call, but there was no service out of out of the city. And I'm walking up the Bowery. And, Gosh, I, I am so thirsty. Um, I, I, there's a little, I found a little deli, so I went into the deli, and I had to go all the way through it to the back to get a, 
a, a, a thing of water and I come up to the counter with the deli and the, the, the fellow behind the deli counter takes one look at me and he says, that'll be a buck. Really? <laughs> Still charging? Everybody in New York is giving away everything. But it, yeah. it didn't occur to me till later. I'm on the Bowery and I, I was like any other Bowery bum. Oh. I was a mess. I was a mess. <laughs> and I keep, I keep my folding money in my right hand pocket and every muscle was cramped and exhausted. And my entire body was shaking, trying to get my hand into my pocket, which normally you just do it and it's done. But this took a minute to get in there and pull a dollar out and put it on the counter. And I walked out of the deli onto the sidewalk and I just crumpled down to, and sat on the sidewalk and leaned against the wall to drink that, that little bottle of water. Thousands of people are walking by, some making comments, some asking if they can help. Every muscle is Charlie Horst. It is just, just, an, it was just an amazing experience. Amazing. So I, finished the, <laughs> I, I finished the water. I stand up and I work my way north because I've got friends up in Midtown. The, the, the woman that I called and her husband. And I get to their, their they have a brownstone and I ring their bell and Lee the wife comes down and opens the door and she just looks at me, doesn't say a word. She looks at my head, scans all the way down to my feet, back up to my head again, and just burst out laughing. <laughs> and it was a contagious laugh and it was perfect. I started to laugh. All the tension was gone because I didn't know what I looked like. No. I, I'd, I'd been walking... <laughs> You I'd, can only imagine. I'd, I'd been interviewed by a couple of news crews and radio crews uh, teams as I was walking north. And uh, they invited me in. I sat down in my in my Pillsbury Doughboy suit <laughs> in oh, front of their times. And I was mesmerized. We didn't know about the second tower even being hit yet, much less collapsing. Didn't know about the first, uh, didn't know about the North Tower collapsing. And it, I just, I couldn't take my eyes off that, the scene. It was un unbelievable that I had been inside that. Yeah. And, in, and later in speaking with, with colleagues, because for six months we didn't do any work. All we could do is talk about th that morning. Every one of us, each one of us thought we were the only one that escaped out of that tower because we all did get out and went separate ways, but couldn't contact anyone. Well, they, they kindly fed me lunch and all transportation systems were shut down. When uh, Grand Central Station opened up, I thanked them. I They loaned me a pair of clothing and I put my suit into a plastic bag. I'm in, I'm in over in short shorts that are three sizes too big for me <laughs> and, a, and somebody's shirt. And I walk up to the train and thankfully find a seat because it's packed and work my way back up to Westchester. And uh, my wife, whose story is more, more interesting than mine, it, it's in the book, you read it. Yeah. <clears throat> so I went to Doug Karpiloff's home. I knew she was I knew instinctively that she'd be with him, with his wife. And she, I parked in front of the house and she saw me and she came flying out of that house, running across the lawn, launching herself into my arms. She was doing like 90 miles an hour. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. People run that fast. Yeah. And I, God, I, I, it, oh, I'll never, never survive this. Of course, it was the greatest hug I ever had in my life. Oh, my God. I'm sure, man. I mean, after all that, you know, both of you, I mean, from her perspective, you know, she was on the outside, you know, and just going through with emotions, you know, she, I mean, she didn't, she, I mean, she just, I mean, her and, you know, everyone else's family that was in there, you know, just had to sit there patiently and wait and see if someone was going to come home. And, 
you were yes. one of the people that was lucky enough to come home and yeah. get that big yeah. hug. <laughs> so I was. So I stayed at at, at, at her home, their Doug Karpilov's home for an hour and talked with his wife and two children. Then <laughs> we went home and it's, that was, it's, now it's dark, of course. We turn all the lights on in the house. And we're up till two o'clock in the morning talking. I can't stop talking about this thing. Finally, we turn all the lights off and go to bed. 10 minutes later, she turns to me and says, you want to talk some more? I said, yes. Got up, turn all the lights on. <laughs> Just <Again>. couldn't sleep. <laughs> the internet was down. No, the internet was not down. The phone systems were down. So we couldn't, we couldn't, uh, anyhow, the next day we were using the internet emails, mm -hmm. emailing our colleagues to, and we began putting together who made it out, who didn't make it out, who we mm -hmm. weren't, weren't sure about, began compiling lists. And I did that for four or five days. And then, then the, then my boss's boss got a hold of me and asked if I'd, if I'd, uh, come and, and, and uh, work in the EOC over in Jersey City, which I which I did. So we worked that and started putting everything together. You know, mm -hmm. I I didn't think I was affected by by that event. <clears throat> I thought, you know, we're men, men are strong. Um, but I was wrong. I was really affected by that event for. For almost four years, you and I couldn't have a conversation because you'd start your sentence. By the time you ended your sentence, I didn't know what the front part of your sentence was. I had no idea what you're talking about. Damn. And that was with all the conversations, especially at, especially at work. And I, I couldn't keep anything in my head for for doing any any errands, or I couldn't do anything. But I'd, I'd go to meetings. They didn't fire me because I, I, I wondered why. I was still a consultant. I missed becoming an employee by 14 minutes. The executive director was having breakfast on Windows on the World, which was on the 110th floor of the North Tower. Nobody above 91 got out alive. Jeez. So so he, he, he expired that morning, as did my friend Doug Karpiloff. They were down in the emergency operations center in one of the six basements of the of the uh, south tower, so he didn't make it out. Um, so um, it took. I go to meetings. Unfortunately, I didn't have to run any of these meetings. And I'd take a I'd take a uh, a clipboard with a pad on it, an old an old military trick. If you want to look official, look like you're doing something. Take a clipboard. <laughs> True. And I'd listen to the speakers and I'd I'd write notes. Well, I wasn't writing anything. I had no idea what these people were saying. I was just I'd look them in the eye and nod, like I'm interested. I have no idea. For four years. Jeez. Unbelievable. How did you and, get it under wraps? Well, I, I then got a new boss and we were all all of the all of the um Transportation agencies, the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey is the largest transportation agency in America. Mm -hmm. The, uh, the uh, New Jersey Transit, the MTA, which runs the subways and buses of New York City, uh, Amtrak, and a number of the other agencies from around the country were calling the Port Authority, calling our office, because we'd set up an office of emergency management by then, to ask, asking us, what are we doing to protect our sensitive infrastructure. Well, they weren't talking about fences. They were talking about how, how are we vetting personnel that might pose an issue in the future. And so I was at the right place at the right time. And I was asked to put together meetings with all of the heads of security and senior management in security uh, and police of New Jersey Transit, Amtrak, MTA, and and in the other big ones, and that I was managed to do. After about the fifth meeting, in in my fourth year, after this is happening, third year, I had a, another new boss, 
who wanted to have this meeting put together. So I put it together and he said he was going to run it. So let's say it started at one o'clock and it was in New Jersey Transit's headquarters in Newark, New Jersey. So I was there. Everybody was there except my boss. One o'clock comes, 105, 110, 115, I stood up. I knew enough first names of, of people and I knew what the ranks of the police were. So I started with, with the chief of New Jersey Transit and I said, chief, and I asked him a question and he answered it and I played off of his answer. He went, pointed around the room calling on captain, a lieutenant, an inspector, and I ran that meeting for two hours. And that was the key that got me over the hump. And I went back to my director and I gave him a five minute summary overview of what we should do to protect our sense of infrastructure. It was a whole new a concept, it was a whole new security um, program. And after five minutes, he, he looked at me and said, make it happen. So now I've got now I've got a goal. I've got a purpose. Yeah. And that got me through. But there were so many, and this 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 is going to lead into um, investing in yourself. <clears throat> okay. Yeah, um, yeah, let's hear it. Because uh, there were so many people that weren't able to cope with that with that the events of that morning. I had a colleague that came in for six months, and all he did was he just he just couldn't control himself. He thought he was sending people to their death. But he was sending people to their their posts when there was this kind of an emergency, mm -hmm. and uh, they didn't make it out. Yeah. He barely made it out, and he was totally shaken. And 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 a number of other number of other people also, and uh, certain sounds, like certain kinds of thunder, I I had to hide. It sounded just like the towers coming down, and just like the aircraft driving into the tops of those towers. And I was taking the train into Manhattan after the fact. And and now, now my office is in New Jersey, so I'm taking trains and subways and buses. But when the trains would come down the track, sounded, I could not stand there. I had to back up, put my back to the train and grab the handrail. And I had to do that for like a year. And then I'd turn around and face the train. And then I'd take a step forward after a number of weeks, and then another step forward after a month and a half, another step forward, kept myself calm, quiet, take a deep breath, be as calm and quiet and controlled as I could until I finally overcame that. I was bound and determined, Adrian, not to let that event control me. I was going to rise above it so that I could be in command of myself. Oh, I mean, that's that, that's very true. I mean, that's how you invest in yourself. I mean, everyone has their own definition of it. And, you know, you and your situation with this, I mean, this horrible, tragic, I mean, horrible event that happened so quickly in just a morning, you overcame it. And, you know, I mean, you, 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 to me, you have a good outlook on it. I mean, you took it as an experience, you know, that, you know, not a lot yeah. of people get, you know, when you live through it and then to overcome all the, you know, the PTSD is what it kind of sounds like, you know, the, the, you know, the, the certain sounds and stuff. I mean, and to yes. slowly make them steps over and over, you know, one, one, one day at a time, or, you know, how many, how many days or years it might have took you, but you did it, you overcame it. And, yes. you know, now, yes. Now you're I did. day to day. I was bound and determined to do it. And I still have difficulty if I'm standing under or driving under a railroad trussle mm -hmm. when a train goes over. But I just keep myself, take a breath, calm down. It's nice and easy. Yeah. Let's get let's get through this. And yeah. and it's work. But you know, that day has given me the opportunity to speak to to you. I've done a number of podcasts. Oh, I've, sure. I've been I'm, I'm registered with a couple of speakers bureaus. I've gone around and I speak with people. It was a keynote speaker. Um, before all that, I had the opportunity to speak with 
What was the one subject on everybody's lips for over a year? One word. It's not. It's not a quiz. COVID. I don't know. <laughs> subject, subject was death. Death. Okay. Everybody was talking <laughs> about. So it gave me the opportunity to to speak with people about death and and calm them down and and to work with 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 many many people and it gave me the opportunity. It was interesting. On Wednesday, September 12th, my wife and I were up late talking into the night again. And the thought was was like pushed into my head. Three words. Write a book. Well, I'm not a writer. <laughs> but that was the thought. Yeah. And, and you ran as, with as, it. So you can see the cover of the book behind yeah. me. Um, I did write a book. And it's it, in, anyway, that's another whole story. But uh, <laughs> that photograph behind me was taken by Jim Ucker, who was one of the the, the, uh, the vendors that was doing some of the 93 upgrades, security upgrade in the, in the building. Mm -hmm. He evacuated, he's credited with evacuating the, the south, the basements of the South Tower. Um, because when the North Tower was struck, he didn't hear it but he felt a difference in air pressure, which was unusual and telling to him. He'd had some experience in his earlier years in, in one or two of the three, three lettered agencies out of Washington, DC. And uh, so he evacuated everybody. He went up into the lobby of this South Tower, looked out and saw a couple of injured men. So he just walked out into the, walked right out into the, Plaza went up to the first injured man. They got his arm over and he helped him out to get him up to an aid station. <clears throat> and as he's walking back for the second man, he's in the plaza and this and the plane comes in and crashes into the South Tower. And that's what, what you see on the cover of that book. The overpressure was so great, it slammed him down on the ground. He had a digital camera in a suit jacket. He took it out and blindly reached up and just blindly clicked the trigger. Oh, geez, what a hell of a picture. And as he told me years, years after the fact, after I hunted him down, he said he wanted his two daughters to know how their father died that morning. And that was the picture that totally unaimed. He just reached up and clicked it. Jeez. And that's, and he he coveted that photograph. He shared it with almost no one. <clears throat> but when it came time for a cover for my book, I woke up in the middle of the night with the thought, contact Jim Usher. Well, I hadn't seen Jim for years. But yeah. anyway, I did some research and the internet's a fascinating tool. Yeah, it is. <laughs> Made contact with him, asked him the question. He did not even hesitate. He gave wow. me his photograph. And Jeez. that's the, the cover of the book. Wow. <laughs> I mean, that's incredible that he was able to get a picture just like that so blindly. And what a great yes. angle it was, you know, to cover yes. everything like that. I mean, just everything falling, fires. Well, those javelins, javelins of, of window glass and javelins of steel coming off that tower. Yeah. He he made it. He he somehow got up, walked out, got to an ambulance. They took him up to the hospital, Jeez. and the doctor like stripped him, and they pulled thousands of shreds of glass out of his body. They were embedded in his skin. Damn. He I saved mean, all of them. Put him a he, little jar. Kept him he? on his <laughs> mantelpiece at home. Yeah, I mean that's something that memorabilia. You know what I mean? Because he survived that. I mean, not not a lot of people did, man. And the people yes. that did, you know, like you, I'm glad that you were able to, uh, you know, share your story and give, you know, I, I guess it's a second chance. I mean, that you got to survive this or I mean, what what would you call it? You know, I mean, a really second chance. I'm sure it changed your mindset on everything on life from surviving. Well, well I, I, I'm, I'm the of the conviction that nobody dies <clears throat> one minute before their set time. Yeah. That's so, the and I've got some got some fascinating stories and I'll give you one one brief one quick one if you're due to die no no one no angel is sent to 
direct you out of harm's way. Mm -hmm. I was walking between the towers and a little voice said, walk east. That was the opposite direction. I oh. couldn't see, I couldn't see who was sent, but I could hear. <clears throat> there was a, a, a young man, a gentleman who worked uh, at Cantor Fitzgerald, which is way up, I think like on the 101st floor. And he, for the last month and a half, he would, when he got to the donut store on in the plaza, he'd turn his head away from the donut store. He loved donuts. He'd stop every morning for donuts. But he's his avoir de poids. He was getting a little bit of a pot. So he was he was bound and determined to discipline himself. Mm -hmm. And so he did. He'd walk by, he'd go up to his office. The morning of September 11th, he's sitting in his office and he has the thought. I really want a donut. And finally he said, by God, I want a donut. I'm going to go get a donut. He broke his, he broke his training. He got up, he took the elevator down. He transferred it, took it down to the, the uh, lobby level. He walked out across the plaza, got to the donut shop. And the aircraft drove right through his tower, right through his office. He, he was not due to die that morning. He was pushed out. The thought was get a donut because they they knew they knew his desire. <laughs> and I've got hundreds of stories like that. I know. <laughs> I mean, it's just insane how just that one little thought that's pushing you so much, you know, that that particular morning too probably changed a lot of people's lives. You know, they could have you know, been dead, you know, I mean, it just wasn't their time to go. Yeah, there, everyone has a fascinating uh, story of why they were or were not there that morning. My neighbor across the street was the manager of Windows on the World. Mm -hmm. He got on the train platform and as the train's approaching, he remembered, he, he kept his train ticket, his monthly ticket in his wallet. He didn't have his wallet. He said, well, the conductor knows me. Then he said, no, I'll go home. I'll just take the next train. Went home, got his wallet, took the next train, which was 20 minutes later. By the time he got to the World Trade Center, it was he would have been stuck up there like everybody else. But wow. it was not his time wow. to go. So the powers that be made him forget his wallet. Yeah. His, his, yeah, I've got hundreds of stories like that. No, no. Not to, yeah. from, from, any disaster those stories yeah. come out i mean in the book too i think you 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 throw out there quite a bit of them i think one of the chapters was somewhat dedicated to that if i'm remembering right just um, about about people i may have yeah mentioned you, certain facts about some of the people i spoke, spoke about in the books. yeah yeah because i mean and and like i said you know the people that are listening you know his book gives his perspective you know his wife's perspective all kinds of different people and tad was a interesting one he was one of my you know favorite ones because he had he's Ooh. just so calm about everything and <laughs> he's like ah oh, no big deal kind of thing and i mean i mean there's all kinds of different people's perspectives and stuff in there so these were yes. people that you met up with after the fact and you know did an interview Some with them. Already knew, uh, and i heard so many stories i went out and introduce myself to those I wanted to ask their permission mm -hmm. to uh, publish. And Tad Hank, of course, is one of them, an engineer on the 86th floor or whatever floor, Yeah, just about ready to go into the sub basements. And he's magnificent morning. He looks out the window, his office faced north. And you could, on a clear day, you could see aircraft flying up the Hudson to, to Westchester Airport and then across Manhattan to LaGuardia Airport. And as he pivots to turn to leave his office, something something in his mind registered that was something wasn't right. Didn't know what it was. So he turned to look out the window again. He scanned from the East River on his left, across Manhattan to the Hudson River on his right, and then back to Manhattan. <clears throat> and he lowered his eyes and he saw a jet airliner flying down Fifth Avenue just missed the top of the Empire State Building. And he's standing there, mesmerized. The aircraft is flying very fast, headed towards the tower. 
coming towards tower one and he realized it's aimed directly at his office. And he's mesmerized, he he's, can't move. And just as the plane approaches and he knew, know, knew it was his last breath, the nose of the plane rises slightly and the plane banks a little left east. He sees what he thought were the pilots and he saw the passengers in, their, in the passenger windows and the American Airlines logo. And then he heard the noise and the building shook a little bit and he was okay. Yeah. He sat down and started emailing his brother and various people. Yeah, it's like, what the heck? You'd think you'd just run, go, go, go. And he's just, let me get my yogurt and stuff or whatever, fruit. And that's, and that's just the beginning of his day. Yeah. Everyone had, it's just, the experiences are, are, are each one is more fascinating than, than the previous. Yeah, you're right. So, you know, but, uh, well, do you, are you ready to wrap up? Do you have any, you know, final thoughts or you want to promote your book, of course, and anything else? I, I I think that probably does it, Adrian. You've been very kind. Your questions have been good. Yeah. And the 25th anniversary is coming up. I met just this past Thursday with my publisher and agent. And uh, we're, he's, the publisher is a Fifth Avenue, a small Fifth Avenue publisher. Mm -hmm. And he wants to uh, work a deal out with one of the larger publishing companies that's got marketing and uh, see if we can't, can't, push this out a little further for the 25th anniversary. That'd be a good I'll idea. Be doing, I'll be doing a fair amount of, of public speaking yeah. with that coming up. Take so I'm looking every, forward. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. Every opportunity to speak. <laughs> promote, promote, so, promote. <laughs> so, so people that are might that might be interested, read your your uh, review. And Amazon.com's got like 500 reviews. And uh, they're all just incredible. I'm, it's it was just amazing to me because I I don't write for a living. The occasional thank you note <laughs> at birthdays <laughs> and in the holidays. <laughs> right. Yeah, well, and I mean phenomenal. you phenomenal. You live through it. So I mean it's natural. Yeah. You know what I mean? So that's why it was so easy to probably write all these and meet up with all these people because you guys all went through a traumatic, very traumatic experience. So you're able to make something positive out of it though. You know what I mean? We did. So um, that's why I thought of you for investing yourself. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, thank you. And I always give credit to to our troops who are serving and have served, and our veterans because this was just one day, just a really like not even two hours. But no. the after no. effects were the residuals were were traumatic. But our yeah. troops suit up, yeah. and they go out every day, not knowing if they're going to come back or come back with body parts missing, and that takes tremendous courage even though they have no choice, still takes courage and gumption to do that. Absolutely. And and the first responders that are going into fires every day and the police that are facing difficulty with with bad guys every day. So they're the real heroes. Yeah, they are, man. We had, we, had, we those of us in those towers had only one job, get out. Yeah. That's it. We didn't <laughs> have anything else to do. Just get out. Mm-hmm. All of our, our sweethearts and friends and people <laughs> watching television, they went through hell because they could see what we couldn't see and didn't know. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, everybody that seems to, uh, you know, that I speak with that are, you know, that were able to process and that were older, you know, like 10 years older, or, you know, on above you know at that day i mean they all remember where they were at when 9 11 happened i asked my dad my grandparents cousins and stuff i mean parent friends and family just everything and everyone seems to know i was only one years old man i was only i was born in 2000 so i i, I don't i wasn't yeah. you know able to be aware of that kind of stuff you know so you know it's yeah. interesting hearing it from you from someone that was actually inside there though and break it down so yeah. i appreciate you coming on well, it brings it to life. It's 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 not secondhand information. <laughs> Very true. Uh, but I, I I thank you for having me. Twenty almost twenty two years later. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, of course, man. The story will always be interesting to people. I think because you know it was something that happened. You know to our you know our country and stuff you know especially in the u.s it'll be very interesting for people to always read so if you guys want to check out his book i'll put the link in the description 
And, you know, thank you again so much for coming on, Eric. Adrian, thanks so much. I've had a delightful time with you. I appreciate the opportunity. Eric is a survivor of a horrible event. He is very lucky to be alive and share his story. I think today's main takeaway is to enjoy life because you never know when something life-changing can happen. Please comment any key takeaways that you got from this interview. Please share it with anyone that you think will enjoy this type of content. Also, please be sure to subscribe to my channel for more interviews like this. If you want to get a copy of Eric's book, I'll put it in the video description. I highly recommend it. It was a really great read. And the last thing that'll pop up at the end of this video is a playlist of all my other interviews I've done in the past. Thank you again so much for watching, and we'll see you on the next one.